And uh, they just didn't follow through. It doesn't feel too good. And, and sometimes, have you ever made a promise to somebody? And maybe, I won't ask you to raise your hand if you maybe didn't keep that promise. But sometimes when we're on the other end of that, we sometimes kind of make justification. Well, you know, this happened. And I, you know, a good, I mean, well, how will I just that, that's why I didn't keep my promise or whatever. But sometimes, you know, as, as people, we look at promises and promise keeping and, and we recognize that uh, we sometimes don't always keep our promises or others may not keep them with us, but we do have an amazing God that always keeps his promises. And today, we are gonna go through a few of those. And um, I, I have, uh, I promise not to, Oh, I not, shouldn't see that. I'm using the word promise there. Um, I will do my best to, uh, you, you may look at this sheet and go, man, that's a lot of them, but we're going to move rather quickly through them. Uh, I'm going to read them, and for sake of time, these are all from the New King James Version. Um, you feel free to, to check those spelling and all that. I copied it right, copied and pasted, so I promise there's been no uh, adjustment there. But I figure sometimes it's harder for us to wait, and I'd love to get as many promises as I could in. <laughs> so when we're looking it up, uh, I'm, I'm usually one that I love to open my Bible and read it right from there. Uh, but, but for sake of time, I put them on a piece of paper so I could get as many as I could in. And so... Um, we're going to talk about that, God. Guess how many verses are in the Bible? Does anybody know? It's quite a few. Anybody want to guess? No, no guesses even, huh? 31,102. That's what Google told me. And, um, and guess how many promises there are? Again, Google uh, says 7,500 7,500 promises, which is roughly a quarter of the Bible, is there's a promise found in there that um, it's pretty amazing how God would know that we, need, we would need that encouragement. We would need his promises to help us through the day. Um, and he's given them to us, but he's also asks us, asks us to do something with them. He's asked us to put them into our mind, in our hearts, right, to, to know them. Because there will be times in our life that we need to claim them, right? Just I gave you a little example of, of my life where had I not put that there, I would have been in despair. I was already in despair, right? But boy, I had a much greater peace when I knew that, hey, God, you've told me this and you've promised, so I'm going to trust you. And uh, some, some of these promises are conditional, Right? You know, God says, if you do this, this will happen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, right? Can he, can he, can he forgive a sin that's not confessed? No. So he, but he desperately wants to forgive us, right? So all, the only thing we have to do is confess. So there are conditional promises, and we should understand that and do our best to, to actually, you know, take that condition and, and, and do that. But we understand also, um, you know, there, there are some times that God answers uh, in ways that we question. Why? You know, why, Lord? Why did you do it that way? Why did you answer me in that way? And that, those are difficult times. But we don't always understand God, right? Isaiah 55, 8, and 9 tells us that we can't understand God's thoughts and his ways. They're not ours. But... If we knew, if we understood God, we would be God, right? So we would, if we understood everything he did and everything about the world and everything, we'd kind of need to be him. So we have to trust that, you know, from all the other ways that he's shown us, the ways that we can trust him, we have to believe in that. And so 
There will be a day, though, that soon when we get to heaven, we'll have lots of time to say, Lord, why did you do that? And we're going to look back and go, wow, look at that. Look at how he connected these things. And uh, he did the best that he could with all the scenarios and situations and people he had. And he worked it out perfectly in his own time. So we can trust that. So why do we think we can trust God's promises? 1 Corinthians 1.20 says that, and all his promises are yes. So the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.20 that all his promises are yes. We can trust and believe that. And uh, sorry, I haven't gotten quite to the sheet yet, but if you're looking for that, where that is on the sheet. So <laughs> is it possible for God to lie? No, it is not possible. It's pretty neat if you think about creation, right? Well, the Bible tells us too in, in Hebrews 6.18 that he can't lie. In creation, when God said something, what happened? It became, whatever it was. So when God's word says something, it has to happen. right? So if he says, let there be light, guess what? It had to be light because he said it. So if we, if we trust in his promises and we know that um, whatever he says is true and um, that it must happen, we can have that belief and understanding and, and faith in that. Do you ever need power in your life? I know I do. There's times where we get discouraged or we need strength and courage and power. And God's word is full of it. And uh, one, you know, there's, there's lots of, you go into the gas station, there's lots of ways where they tell you can get power, right? From these pills or these drinks or whatever you, you know, the, the Red Bull, right? Uh, well, the Bible is the, is the real source of power that we need to turn to. And uh, we praise the Lord that he has given us that to us. The first promise, what, does anybody know what the first promise in the Bible was? It was found in Genesis. It was in the Garden of Eden. And uh, Adam and Eve had just sinned. And, uh, and um, the Lord is speaking to Satan, and he says, you know, you're going to bruise Christ here, but I'm going to send Christ. He, he will come, and he will provide salvation to all. That was the promise. And what was interesting, if you look at the timeline of that, that was before he told Adam and Eve all of the things that they were going to then, the consequence of their sin. But he had promised them before that and said, listen, you may have won this battle, but I win the war. And you know what? I'm, you know, Christ is going to come. He'll, sa he'll save his people. And they heard that promise. So when they then, when, when, they, when, he, when the Lord turned to them and basically said, listen, you know, unfortunately because of your choices, these are the things you're going to have to deal with in life, they had the promise to hold on to. And we can hold on to those same promises. All right, you ready to get to dive in? Ready to put your seatbelts on? All right, Exodus 14, 14, we're starting at the top. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. So the Lord will fight for you. That's a promise, right? What's the hard part of that? The second part, right? <laughs> while you keep silent. Sometimes we think we know the answer. We're like, hey, Lord, come on. I mean, just do this. This is obviously what you need to do to fix the situation. This is how you need to fight for me. But when, you know, it's like me coming up to Ben Carson, he step aside, you know, I know you're a brain surgeon, you know all that stuff, but I, you know, I'm good. I, I, I think I got this, you know. <laughs> I, just hand me the scalpel. Like, no, no I mean, and I, you know, we're not comparing Ben Carson to God, but you, you know, we sometimes think we have this knowledge and we have this understanding that really needs to be deferred to God and let him work through and while we keep silent, understanding that the battle is his, he is faithful, and he will keep us. All right, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So what would, what would this type of promise be called? A con conditional, very good. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. That's what he's calling us to do. 
Every day he calls us to do that. And he calls us his people, which is amazing. And he will actually forgive us. You know, even though we're wretched sinners, even though we fall and stumble, he says, you're still my people. I still love you. Come to me. Keep coming to me. Seek my face. Humble yourselves. Humble is a tough word, isn't it? <laughs> Humble is a very tough word, but God is faithful when we do that. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So we can experience true joy. You know, there's, there's many times where um, we, we come to God with our trials in life, and we come with almost a complaining spirit. Uh, at least I do. I don't know if you do. So I, I know that, you know, we, we're like, oh, Lord, why is this happening? And, and, but he says, listen, you know, in your presence, we're told that in, in God's presence is fullness of joy. If we, we come to him, near, we come draw near to him, his right hand are pleasures forevermore. He will show us the path of life. He will guide us. And, um, and if we trust and say, Lord, I, I, I trust that you're going to lead me. I trust that you're going to guide me. Even if I don't know the path you're going to send me on, I know you do. And I can experience that joy and pleasure forevermore. All right, Psalms 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. So I love that. I will guide you with my eye. So, you know, God's vision is perfect. Amen? He sees all things. His, his eyes, he sees perfectly everything in life. So we can trust that and know that he sees it. I know for us, We've prayed many a times in big decisions, we've claimed this promise. And we say, Lord, you have promised that you will instruct us. You have called us to come to you, to seek you, seek your face, and to lead us and guide us. I know when we were moving here to Michigan, this was a big one. We were claiming, like, Lord, um, I don't, you know, as a male, it's hard because you want to act like you know the directions, right? You don't want to ask for directions. <laughs> you don't want, you know, I know how to get there. Uh, no, Lord, I, I know that you know, and I'm going to defer and trust in you and claim that promise that uh, he will instruct us and teach us. All right. Psalms 34, 4. This is a great one as well. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I've been have anybody had fear in life? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of times where we fear things. You know, you think about, um, you know, times of life that have, uh, were not going the way we wanted them to go. I know there's been many times um, in my life that um, without God, and I don't know how people do it without the Lord. I honestly don't. I think, how, what do you have to hold on to in these times like this? I, can, I truly understand why people um, have large, especially in the world today, severe depression and anxiety. Um, and and uh, we know that God can help us. He tells us right there. He's del he can deliver us from that when we seek him. But it's, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all not just many of my fears, but says all my fears. Psalms 94, 19. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. So again, we in the midst of anxiety, you know, you know, it's it's not about what what uh, it's not about ourselves where we focus and say, Lord, it's you know, I have this anxiety. It's Lord, I'm giving it to you. You know, I know, I know that these things are happening around me, and I know that, you know, you know, from a human perspective, you could easily say, boy, this is creating much anxiety. But in the midst of that, I can turn to you in your comfort will delight my soul. It's not about God forgetting us. It's, just, it's about us reminded of how God is with us and will help us through those trials. Proverbs 2 6, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. <laughs> I personally have to claim this one a lot. <laughs> so, um, because 
uh, again, we've talked about wisdom, you know, thinking we know best, and uh, we just have to continue to go back to the, fig- the, to the point that we don't have it figured out. Life, we, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky to, not lucky, I'm blessed to just know what I'm going to do today, you know, and that's, that's what the Lord has called us to do. Don't borrow our worries from tomorrow. He says, listen, I'm, I've got you. I'm going to show you today what I need you to do each step of the way. And when we trust in that, he will give us the wisdom, he will give us knowledge, he will give us understanding, because every day we have to constantly make decisions. Some big ones, some small ones. But some of those small ones add up <laughs> to be big ones that, do, that guide us and direct us in our life. So we know that we need to trust in that. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. This is one, a text that's pretty, it's, 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 on, it's all over the you know, place. You know, if you go to um, Hobby Lobby, or you could get a big, <laughs> nice picture of it, or, which I love. I think we probably have, I think we have one of those in our house, which I love scripture everywhere to, be, to remind us. This is one, too, though, that sometimes we get into these um, when we know texts that are very popular, we don't always sit down and really grasp the deep meanings of these texts because we, we will we'll quickly say them. And, uh, and so when he says, in all, and sometimes we go to the second part, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Lord, we just want you to direct our paths. But he says, no, you got to trust me, you know, with all of your heart, not with just part of it. Don't try to figure it out on your own. Don't lean on your own understanding. But acknowledge me as your Lord. And when you do those things, I am going to direct your paths. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You ever need peace? <laughs> I do. Again, these are wonderful promises about peace and him guiding us. This is also... Um, a conditional. What, how do we get that perfect peace? When our mind is stayed on him. You know, when, we, when our mind is not stayed on him, it's easy to get, to lose that peace because we begin to question things and we begin to say, Lord, I don't know if you know what you're doing. But if we keep our mind on him, he is faithful and, and we can trust and he will give us that perfect peace and he will increase our faith through that. Isaiah 41.10, we read earlier, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. He tells us, fear not. When Christ was in the boat, and there was a big storm, and he was asleep, <laughs> do you think he was fearing? <laughs> no, he, he knew where he was supposed to be. He, he had woken up that morning. He had followed God along the way, the Father had told him what to do, and he was tired. He got in the boat, he was sleeping away, and, and the disciples <laughs> were a little, they had a different experience. They were like, oh! you know, they were scared, they were fearing greatly for their lives. Yeah, <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, get him up, get him up, help us, Lord. And he, and he wakes up, and he, you know, in the midst of the storm, he, he, did, he wasn't fearful. He got up. He, he, he knew, again, where he was supposed to be. He knew that the Lord had led him along each part of his day. And he trusted the Lord, and he stood up, and he said, Peace be still. <laughs> and praise the Lord that when we can have that experience in the midst of a storm, we can know, you know, I'm not going to fear, Lord, because you are in control. And um, he is faithful in doing that. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, But now thus says the Lord who created you, for God is our creator, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. So, we, do you think he has a vested interest in us? <laughs> he formed us, or he created us, he formed us, he redeemed us. He's like, hey, listen, <laughs> you don't think I love you, and you don't think I, I want, I'm going to keep you and, and care for you? He's promised that, and praise God, he's given us his word uh, for that. You've got there, um, 
I've often thought of um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. I just wonder if they, if they had that text hidden in their hearts and in their minds, and they said, you know what? I don't have to fear. Lord, if, if, you, if you want me to be in this fire, and that's what they told Nebuchadnezzar. Said, you know what? If you put us in there and we die, we're okay with that. But we also know the one who would keep us through the fire. So there's, there's promises that we can hold on to in the midst of our own fiery trials, right? And we can say, Lord, you are with them. Lord, be with us as well. All right, next one, Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. Morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Um, have you ever been in a tough situation where you don't know what to say? And sometimes you don't always have to say something, right? It's, it's okay not to say something, just to be with somebody and show them that you love them and, and sit and cry with them. You don't always have to have a word. But then it says there's a, uh, it's, it does say there, though, the, a word in season to him who is weary. So there are times where the Lord would have us to speak and comfort and, and share God's comfort in, with people. And that's where we can claim that. You know, when you're in those situations, Lord, you know, Isaiah 50, verse 4, you, you've told me, you, you'll help me to say what you want me to say. Help me right now. He awakened us morning by morning. Be careful on that prayer. <laughs> He'll wake you up. <laughs> and uh, just like he's, he's done it throughout the Bible, he did it with his son. You know, that was how Christ connected to him. To, his, to the Father, you know, and he, morning by morning he would, he would awaken him and spend that special time. And he is, it's always, I'll tell you what, it's hard to do, and I can't claim 100% on <laughs> doing that, but there are times, every time that I've woken up and I've said, Lord, I'm going to spend the time. You woke me up, I want to spend that time with you. I've never, ever been disappointed. Amen. To think that the creator of the universe woke up because he wanted to spend time with me? Wow, I better get up. <laughs> and I better spend that time with him. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. The devil knows us, his angels, the, the evil angels, they know us. They, they know how to form their weapons against us. They know our tendencies or the way that we act. And, and uh, praise God that we can claim that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And we say, Lord, you know what? <laughs> I know that I, uh, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Lord, I want to be your servant uh, the heritage that you tell me is that the devil cannot prosper against me. And we need to claim that as the devil comes to try to attack us. All right, next page, Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I have sent it. So we think about um, what God says. It's going to happen. Again, this is another. These are just added. Sometimes there's, there's, there's certain things that we read in, in the Word and, um, which are amazing promises. But when he says it over and over and over again, we're like, listen, you said it here. You said it here. I, I, these are just confirmation after confirmation of what he said is true. And so um, he has promised that what he says is going to happen will actually happen. It will not return to him void. It's, it's, he said it. It's not like it can't happen. Jeremiah 24, 7, Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Somebody said this one time, and I thought it was great. 24, 7, right? <laughs> Jeremiah 24, 7, it reminds us every single day we need that new heart, right? And Lord, I'm going to claim the promise that you will give me a new heart today. Every day, 24, 7, I need you to, to give me that. And, uh, that I will, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And they shall return to me with their whole heart. He wants us, you know, for struggling in our connection to him, he wants us to come to him and say, 
Give me that heart. I want to know you. And, and I want to come to you, back to you, Lord. When I've strayed away, I want to return to you. And with my whole heart, help me to do that. We, we, we just, I mean, I've been rereading the step, book, Steps to Christ. What an amazing book. And um, just a reminder of, there's so many things. We just can't do it on our own. We can't change our hearts. We can't, you know, we can't even confess our sins without him giving us that desire and to, to change. And, and so we, we just have to humbly turn to him and say, Lord, help me to return to you. I know, and I know that you love me. And I know, and we, we sense his love and his desire to be with us. That's what changes us and draws us to him. And we, just, we need to ask him to help us in that. Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? <laughs> Says it all. There's nothing, God is, he's God. He's, you know, there's nothing that his power, you know, he, that he cannot accomplish. Um, and so there's nothing too hard for him. We can trust in that. Matthew 5, 6, 5, 6 Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Another conditional promise, right? If we want to be filled, we need to ask for that hunger and thirst. We need to say, Lord, Help me turn to you. Help me turn to your word. You know, we have God-shaped hearts that we try to fill and try to force things in there that we think are going to make us happy, but they never do. But when we turn to him and say, Lord, help me hunger and thirst for what is right and what is good, and he will change those things for us. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we're weary, he's there for us. If you've ever seen a yoke, it's, a, it's this piece of wood that <clears throat> if you've seen oxen or cattle, they, they yoke each other next to each other. And they can do so much more together than, than apart. And God is saying, Lord, I want to be right next to you. I want to be there to take the burden off of you. So that, but he is also calling us to work, right? I mean, when, when, when the oxen are, are yoked up, they're not just yoked up and then go lay down in the pasture. He's like, no, I want you to work. I want to be with you to give you the strength that I need you to have in order to work for me. And so praise God, he gives us the strength and he gives us the rest we need so that... Um, we can continue to work for him. John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all the things that I have said to you. So many times, I, I, we were talking about this, Dave, and I was, you know, the name, you know, trying to remember a name. <laughs> I mean, something as small as remembering a name. He helps us to remember so many things that we need to be reminded of throughout our lives. And we see, remember when I told you this. Remember how I've led you in the past. I'm going to lead you again. Remember how I was with you here? Well, I'm going to be with you there as well. And um, when we put the things into our hearts and in our minds, he can recall them, right? That's, in order to remember something, we kind of need to actually have, <laughs> have uh, put it in there to, to recall. So the, our part is, you know, Lord, help me to put into my mind and my heart the things that you told us so that I can remember them. John 15, 5 and 7, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I, know, I don't know about you, but sometimes, um, I, there's times I don't know how to ask. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to do. And, but I can tell you this, when we yoke up with the Lord, when we abide in him, when we put his words into our heart, we begin to think, we begin to speak, we begin to act in the ways that his word has called us to do so that the things we say are are from the Lord, you know, and so we begin to be changed by his word. He, he, he transforms us by the renewing of our mind. It's another promise that he, he shapes our minds and, and he begins to, to wear the things we talk, the way we pray, the way we talk to the Lord, the way we talk to others is just a reflection of what we put in there from the Lord and from his word. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that 
we should no longer be slaves of sin. Praise God for the victory he can give us in sin. I mean, every day is a battle. Every day we have tendencies of sin. Once, you know, if we, when we give our lives to the Lord, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been nice if we never sinned again? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but we have battles. The devil is there after us each day, and we have battles. But God is faithful, and he will crucify that old man in us, and that body of sin might be done away with, and we're, he'll give us the victory and the sins in our life. I mean, I look at, I've got a long ways to go, a long road ahead, it's salvation. I mean, um, sanctification is a lifetime. But you look back, you go, know, that thing that I struggled with, I really don't care about that anymore. Thank you, Lord, that you gave me victory over that. Now, as he reveals more to us, we got, okay, Lord, you got to have to help me with this now. And uh, so, but he is, we can be confident that he can give us victory over sin. Uh, Philippians 1, 6, being confident in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Again, same thing. He started that work in us. And every single day, he's going to help us grow closer to him and more like him. And, it's gonna, and he doesn't end that until he comes. He has begun a work in you. will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So praise God, he doesn't ever stop working in our lives. Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you to both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Who is it that does the work in our lives? It is God. <laughs> We've got to you know, rem be reminded of that daily, Lord. I'm not going to just figure out how I need to be better or, or how I need to do your work, Lord. But I want you, because you promised that you will do the work in us. And you will, we will work out your will in our lives for your good pleasure. <clears throat> Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which suppresses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, we can lose that anxiety. When we come to him with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving and make our requests known to God, again, he gives us, verse 7, the peace of God which surpasseth all understanding. And that peace will guard our hearts and minds against the, the evil one. James 1, 5, and 6, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. We, I mean, the Lord is ready and willing to give us wisdom. He's ready and willing to be by our side. He's ready and willing when we ask in faith. When we don't have faith, we have to be reminded. The Bible tells us um, in Romans 12, 3, that we've each received a measure of faith. We, he's give, we're, we have faith, but he, we're also told in Hebrews 12, 2, that Christ gives us more faith. He is the author, he created the faith, and he's the perfecter or finisher of our faith. So when we go to Christ... We go to him. We say, Lord, continue to give me the faith that I need. Strengthen me. Give me continual um, help in that. He is faithful to do that. And he will give us the faith we need and the wisdom we need. James 4, 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The danger is just skipping that first part there and just saying, resist the devil and he will flee from you, right? The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. It does say that, but don't forget the first part. Submit to God. Amen? That's how the devil can, can flee from us. Only when we're submitted to God and what he has called us to do. So the last one, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. As his divine power has given us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us by glory and virtue, by which, we, which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, what we've just been talking about, that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we recognize that God will give us his power. It says his power has been given to us in all parts of life. But how do we get that? It says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. He wants us to be like him. There's so much joy and happiness 
when when we give him our lives and we surrender to him he says i just want to give you joy and happiness and when we do that we begin to take on his nature and we praise god for that does, it, does anybody know who this is a gentleman by the name of sir ernest shackleton you ever heard of him some have okay I was hoping y'all hadn't heard of Sir Ernest Shackleton. <laughs> so it's a good story. I'm going to read a real quick blurb here. During one of, um, so he was famous for going on expedition in Antarctica. So in the cold. <laughs> so um, this is his boat here. Um, and it's, it's uh, I don't know about you, um, oops, that, that, that doesn't look appealing to me to go on that expedition. So, but <clears throat> one of his, during one of Sir Ernest Shackleton's attempts to cross the Antarctic Ocean in 1914, his ship, the Endurance, was crushed by an, in an ice floe. The crew drifted for days until they made a landing on Elephant Island. Shackleton had met or had the men set up camp there where they could preserve their supplies and try to survive the coming winter. But he soon realized that no one would be coming to rescue them. Nobody knew where they were at, and they were in the middle of nowhere in Antarctica, <laughs> in the frozen ice. And can you imagine that sinking feeling like, we're, there's, there's nobody coming for us. Um, so no one had any idea where they were. They were cut off from the world by the freezing, stormy Antarctic Ocean. There was only one hope of a rescue. Someone had to cross the hostile ocean and get help. Shackleton began to rig a 20-foot whaling boat, 20-foot boat on <laughs> the ocean, uh, for the voyage. From volunteers, he picked a crew of six people. They would have to cross 800 miles of tempestuous sea in order to reach a Norwegian whaling station on the frozen island of South Georgia. He made a promise to his men. He made a promise that he would return. It seemed like an impossible task in an open boat at the stormiest time of the year, but Shackleton set out with his men. For days they huddled, huddled under a makeshift canvas covering, keeping the boat, um, keeping the boat turned in, into the fiercest waves, praying that the wind wouldn't tear away their small sail. They endured bone chilling. See that little, well, that, I'm sorry. This is their boat. And they, this is the, the 20 foot boat they went across the ocean in, in the freezing water. <clears throat> um, they endured bone chilling cold, sleeping bags frozen stiff, icy water streaming down their backs, hunger and thirst. 14 days after their journey or their voyage began, when they were almost dead of exposure and thirst, they saw this. They spotted the black cliffs of South Georgia. They then had to trek across extremely dangerous mountainous terrain. For their journey, the survivors had only equipped, were only equipped with boots they had pushed screws into to act as climbing boots, a carpenter's pick, or it's called an, I don't even know how to say that, so it's a pick, and 50 feet of rope. They traveled 32 miles on foot in the frozen tundra, and with two crew members for 36 hours to reach the whaling station at Stromness on May 20, 1916. Immediately, what did he think? What do you think? What do you, where did his mind turn towards? His men. He said, I made a promise, and I'm going back to get those men. After four attempts, four attempts, Shackleton finally made it through and returned to Elephant Island to rescue the 22 crew members that were stranded there for four and one half months in the middle of winter in Antarctica. The journey was finally over, but how did the crew survive? How do you think they survived? They remembered, they believed the promise of their faithful captain who said, I'm coming back. Amen. We have a faithful captain, do we not? The last promise in the Bible, do you, do you know Revelation 22, 20? Surely I am coming quickly. I'm coming back to get you. He's given us promise after promise. He started the, pro, he started the Bible in the Garden of Eden. I'm going to bring salvation. And then he ends the Bible. I'm coming back to get you. 
If you look at all of his promises, you can always tell that he's faithful in every single one of them. And we can trust and, and praise him for what an amazing God that we have. How many today want to be reminded and put those promises in our heart each day and draw closer to him for his soon return? How many want to join me today? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God. You've given us so much to be thankful for. You, when we look back through our lives, Lord, you've guided us, you've directed us, you've given us peace, you've given us hope, you've provided all of our needs, Lord. And there's so much that we can just praise you for. Lord, we know the time ahead of us is probably going to be, not probably, it will be stormy. It'll be like being on the Antarctic Ocean, trying to get through the storm. But you have promised that you will return for us and you will come and take us home together to live with you very soon. We pray that we will be faithful, we will hold fast to your promises, and very soon, Lord, we want to go back home with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.